Jenny Morton, if you could travel backwards or forwards in time, which era would you choose and why? Ooh. I'd like to go forward, although I don't really believe in the concept of linear time, but I'd like to go to somewhere we haven't been yet from uh, our human perspective and into a, a place where artistry is honoured a lot more than it currently is it's seen as the 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 leader the you know i always see the artists kind of drive evolution really because it's the artists who go look at life this way look at life this way don't look at it the same and that's what helps us see life in in new perspectives which give people choices if the artists weren't there people might just be doing the same thing over and over and i feel like art has typically only been lauded from the future looking back at the past oh those beautiful paintings of the renaissance where those artists died in poverty and were not honored in their time so i'd love to live in a time where art is is given the value that i think it has for for society and is supported in that way and this of course would be a timeline where we didn't need money and all these things we were just we had free energy and we could just be the full expression of ourselves without having to worry about that being attached to a particular income to pay rent, which again can can stifle a lot of our artists because they feel like they've got to do, get a proper job. Mm, yeah, I feel like your answer is way deeper than mine. <laughs> I, I would really love to go back to the 19th century. I'm just fascinated by the Victorians and how they advanced certain things and, and the entertainment of the time and the social attitudes and the fashion, the way people thought, because some of their thinking was a little bit funky. Like, for, for example, not to turn this into a history podcast or anything, Jenny, but the, the Victorians believed that getting up at dawn made their lips look better, brighter and more red. Interesting. Yeah. And that wearing a corset would help support the woman's internal organs because they were believed to have a weaker torso. Oh. Yeah. Which just, can be a problem for singers. Can be a very big problem for singers wearing a corset. And having said that, though, the corsets were also there because of postural benefits. And that's oh. what we've got together to talk about, posture and singing. But, you know, sometimes when I actually cross the room and catch myself in the mirror looking like a cross between Quasimodo and a banana. <laughs> I do wonder if we miss a trick wearing no corsets in the 21st century. Well, it's like be your own corset is kind of the, the, the trick, really. Yeah, well, I like that. I like that <laughs> idea. I like that idea. I was reading an article recently which claims how some health experts are concerned that as humans, we're going to develop into these kind of hunchbacked, clawed hand, red eyed beings due to these changes in lifestyle, like working from home. And it's something that I've seen as an osteopath, sort of having sort of started treating people before we were in the whole phone and laptop era. And I've definitely seen a change in, you know, what we call the tech neck, you know, from being hunched over phones and, and laptops all day, you know, and seeing changes in a much younger age than you would have done previously because now we've got young people who are in their developmental stage are shaping around these devices so they're getting into fixed postures a lot earlier than someone you know might have done in years gone by so I do think it's an issue but I feel like we've kind of reached the apex of that because now we're getting more into the hands-free and maybe the virtual and you know there's other problems associated with that but I feel like we've we've sort of taken that as far as it can go really so I'm hoping that we might evolve out of it but you know just the headaches and things I'm seeing in people and neck pain and 
is just so much more amplified than it was, say, 20 years ago. Why have some of these postures actually become comfortable? And if they aren't optimal, have we just missed the memo from our body to say, oi, this isn't good? Yeah, this is something I get asked all the time, you know, because mm -hmm. when, if I'm working with someone and I'm aiming to get them back into neutral, optimal posture, and I say it's so much more efficient for your body and la la la, but they're like, but it feels like such hard work. <laughs> yeah. So our bodies are kind of, you know, like the scene in a sense, whatever you do habitually becomes habituated. So if you, if we take that example of the sort of rounded shoulders, the neck poke forwards over a phone or a laptop, what happens is the soft tissue, the connective tissue at the front starts to become shortened. Essentially, if you think of, you know, if we look at muscles, first of all, if you ask a muscle to work, obviously it's going to contract and it requires energy to do that. So if you've got your head bent forwards over something, the muscles at the back of the neck or the, and the trapezius muscles and some of the neck muscles are gripping to counterbalance the weight of your head. So the head, in the average person, weighs about 12 pounds. But for every inch it comes forwards of the center of gravity, it doubles. Oh, wow. So I use the sort of analogy of if you had a tennis ball on your head and your head is at such an angle that tennis ball would hit the desk in front of you, what stops your head from hitting the desk, right? It's still under gravity. What stops it is the counterbalancing effect of the musculature that's going to contract in order to offset that load. So if you've got your chin poke forwards, you know, as a lot of people do over phones, you can have about 46 pounds of weight that's hanging off these muscles at the back if if you're doing that on a on a regular basis the brain kind of has a sort of efficiency drive and it's looking at energy output throughout the body and who's taking up more than their allocated share of, of energy output so if a muscle is being asked to grip to counterbalance that weight it's taking a lot of energy to do that if you do that habitually, the, the brain will start going, if you want to hang out like that, I'm going to turn your nice contractile muscle tissue into something more fibrous that will actually hold you there without having to burn a contraction to do it. So I often say to people, if you prod into your thigh muscles or your arm muscles and feel that sort of quite elastic consistency and then prod your <laughs> trapezius muscles here, and they kind of feel like old boot leather. Yeah. They're a very different consistency. Even in some people, they're like, I, feel, I thought that was bone. You know, it's become so hardened. That's a, a, a structural change that the body has made. It's turned the more elastic fibers into a more leathery, fibrous material that more like a ligament than a muscle that will hold and counterbalance the head in that position without having to burn a contraction to do it. The issue is that that has reduced the blood supply through there because the, the blood vessels run through that tissue. So you can get that sort of achy pain, which is when the muscles are asking for oxygen and they can't get it because there's too much tension. there. And because those muscles cross joints, like particularly the neck joints, it's now going to start to restrict your neck movement. And now people start saying, oh, I can't look over my shoulder when I'm in the car and I need to see what's coming. So it'll start to have effects on the underlying structures as well. And so, and what we're doing is we're kind of solidifying ourselves into that shape that we do habitually. So if I, and then what happens to the muscles at the front is they're getting shortened and also the fascia that coats all our muscles is kind of shaping itself, molding itself into that shape so that it'll provide the support you need to be in that um, non-neutral position. So if I then say, well, pull your shoulders back and uh, you're now pulling against all this tense tissue, the muscles at the back have become weakened because they're not supporting so they haven't got the power to then work against the tension of the tissue at the front, which is why you really need to get some hands-on work to release up the tight stuff, bring the blood flow back into 
the muscles that have kind of squeezed it all out, get them fired up so that they can counteract. But, you know, otherwise you're asking very weak muscles to pull against a, a, an increased load and it's going to feel like a hell of a lot of work. So it's sometimes, you know, particularly if you're a singing teacher and you're seeing a particular posture with, with a student and you're saying, well, I'll pull your shoulders back, stand up straight. You have to understand that not going to be achievable necessarily in a short amount of time. And they might need some hands-on work to help them get there if it's an ingrained posture. Yeah. So what is the actual optimal posture that we should be adopting day to day? Yeah, and this is going to be sort of different for everyone as well. It's a very individualized thing, but generally, you know, you're looking again at efficiency. So the center of gravity in the body is sort of aligned with sort of the center of your pelvis, really. If you think of your pelvis as a bowl, you think of a spot right in the middle of it, that's kind of our, our center. So if your head is above that, it's essentially weightless. Again, I use the analogy, you have a tennis ball on your head. If your head is in a position where that tennis ball will stay there without you strapping it down to your head, then you're on balance, right? If you're in any kind of position where that's off center and the tennis ball is going to hit the deck, you're not on balance. One of the things that I see people fall into the trap of, and again, it's quite a Victorian thing, actually, is oh. <laughs> referring back to that straight backs you know, deportment, as they were taught in those days, carry a book on your head. And all that. This notion of your back must be straight mm. is not true. Backs are naturally curved, and this is where it becomes an individual thing. I don't talk about straight backs. I talk about a neutral spine. And what neutral for one might look very different to what's neutral for another. Some people, the curves in their spine, so this is what we're talking about if your side view the curves going front to, you know, we, we have a bit of an arch curve through the lumbar spine and then the thoracic spine curves a little bit forwards and then the, the neck tends to just straighten up that curve. Some people talk about an arch curve of the neck, but it's very, very minimal. But those curves are there for a reason. They're there for shock absorption. So a dead straight structure doesn't dissipate forces as well as a curved one. So actually, I tend to see people who have more issues with, say, lower back pain often are people that either have a naturally much straighter spine or they have got to that place because they tuck their pelvis under as a habit, which is another issue with a lot of people sitting at desks and tucked. That because the, the flatter the spine, the less good it is at absorbing forces. So if you think of every time you walk around, every time your foot hits the ground, there's a shock wave that goes through the whole body. And the body is kind of designed to dissipate that forces before it whacks up into your head. You know, the body is often trying to protect the brain because we can live without fingers and toes and even arms and legs, but we can't if the brain's gone we're in trouble. So it's kind trying to dissipate those forces so that you're not banging on your brain every time your head, foot hits the ground. So the spine, the curves of the spine help to dissipate those forces before they hit up into the, into the head. So the, the, the flatter the spine, the less that shock absorption, the less efficient shock absorption system is. But it's the Goldilocks thing, right? Some people have got too much arch and they've gone to the other extreme. Some have too little. We want that just right. But what the just right looks like in different people can be very different. So you might see somebody who appears to have quite a, a, an arched lumbar spine, but it's actually neutral for them. And or when we're looking particularly, at, at, it's very important that those curves are in their neutral position because a lot of the muscles, particularly the diaphragm, attach into lumbar spine and actually require the lumbar spine to be in its neutral curve for their optimal functioning. So if you, for instance, tuck your tail under, so what we call posteriorizing the pelvis, tucking the pelvis, that can actually af affect the dynamics of, of diaphragm because of the relationship of the psoas muscle, which is getting a little more complicated, 
so as muscle actually is a continuation of the diaphragm, they are called interdigitated. They kind of blend into each other and they have a reciprocal relationship. And we actually require neutral tone of the psoas muscle for the diaphragm to work from it. I always think of it as like a tug of war. You know, if, if we're sort of holding hands and pulling away from each other with equal force, we're in balance. But if one is pulling too much and the other's weak, it's going to fall this way and vice versa. If, if I'm not giving you counterforce and you pull, you're going to be unstable. So the, the diaphragm requires good tone from the, the psoas muscle in order to do a nice, stable in-breath. If you're tucked, the psoas is actually loose. So it's a bit like you're a psoas, you're holding my hand, I'm, I'm a diaphragm. and I want to do a nice, strong put away, but you're loose. Well, I've got nothing to stabilize me mm. so that I can pull away strongly with confidence. Conversely, if someone's super arch, that means their psoas is really tight. And then the diaphragm's trying to pull against too much resistance. So it's the too much, too little. If your spine is neutral, it's just the conditions are just right for optimal diaphragm mechanics. So it's a little bit complex, but you start to see how. You know, in osteopathic terms, we have the phrase structure governs function. So how the structure is set up governs the function of the things that are attached to it. Some literature talks about being able to draw a line from the ear to the shoulder, to the hip, to the knee, to the ankle. But then there are some pedagogues who talk about whether posture is a cause of a vocal difficulty or the symptom of something else, kind of considering this biopsychosocial idea. So what is your opinion there? What are we actually looking at when we're looking at alignment and posture? I mean, that's, that's the key. It is multifactorial and we can't just look at optimal alignment as a series of coordinates on a sheet of graph paper and say, because it also puts the notion into the singers, that's what we're kind of talking about here, of, oh, I've got to be there. If I move my ear two mm. millimeters to the left, you know, what we're really looking for is stability. Are you in a stable position? And that's a dynamic state. And what I tend to see is what I call rigidity. So there's a difference between rigidity and stability. If you think of a building a tall skyscraper, they're actually built to move in the wind, right? They're not built rigid. If you build it rigid and then you get a high wind at altitude, it's going to snap the thing over. Same with like a suspension bridge. You think that's well, incredibly strong structure, but it's actually movable. It's flexible. That's mm -hmm. dynamic stability, and that's really what we're looking for. Stability is is about your ability to autocorrect. It's not about being stuck in one position. If you're kind of rigidly held in this, this is perfect, I'm not moving, and somebody nudges you, you're just going to keel over. Mm -hmm. You need to be in a position that's dynamic. So if I come on, on over and nudge you, you can autocorrect. Mm -hmm. Position. So I don't like people to get into this state of thinking that they're so consumed with is my ear over my shoulder, over my hip, that they can't think of anything else. And actually they they're they're relatively unstable in that position. And what typically tends to happen, again, structure governs function. I think of that also for the emotional state. The more rigid someone's posture is, the more rigid emotionally they tend to be. And at the end of the day, as singers, yes, we have to have good technique and optimal mechanics to produce the sound. But what we're really doing is, you know, human communication, human expression. 
And if you have a conversation with somebody who's standing very still in a rigid posture, not moving anything, and is just talking to you and their mouth is moving, but nothing else is moving, you know, that's freaky. <laughs> You're like, this person's the boy yet. And I had this a lot when I used to do coaching for classical singers and particularly classical singing students as well, sort of, you know, college level students. And they're, you know, we call it the park and bark, right? Where they one hand on the piano, stand still, and it's kind of rigid. And it, all it is is just a mouth moving in this very rigid state. I'm like, that's not human. That's kind of weird. And if you were having a conversation with me, I'd, I'd be a bit like, I need to move away from this person. <laughs> I don't feel very comfortable. So we need to find that human expression. And that's, a, again, a dynamic state. So what I, I tend to talk about with, with, with singers is you need to know where your neutral is. And we can talk about how, how we find that that is unique to you, but it is a felt sense. It's not a series of things on a checklist. And it is a dynamic place from which you then communicate and express mm -hmm. but when your body knows where your optimal neutral is, it's like, it's like a rest state place. So someone's off neutral, and particularly if they've had a lot of dance training, dancers tend to be pitched quite forward over the balls of their feet, which actually makes everything grip. Yeah. Not a good place for vocalizing in. And again, there's a lot of energy expenditure there. It's not very efficient uh, for the body. You start to limit your options at that point. I call it controlled falling. Mm. You're not in balance, you're in controlled falling. If you're in controlled falling, you don't have many options. So we need to know where the place is where we have options. But obviously, particularly if you're in musical theatre or something and you're dancing while you're singing, you're not going to be in your optimal neutral posture all the time just by nature of the choreography. But if your body knows where that neutral is, it's like, and if, again, I mentioned earlier, the, the brain likes to go for efficiency. Every time you pass through that, it's, it's like a, a known quantity to the brain. And it's like, oh, we can rest there. We can have that moment of, oh, we're on balance and then we're off again. And then we're on balance and then we're off again. If you don't know where that neutral is, you're always in controlled falling. Right. So... Helping an uh, artist find where is your neutral, where's the, the most efficient place for you to vocalize from, but you don't have to be stuck there, but it's a place that you move in and out of. And every time you're in it, there's a moment of respite where when you're thinking about muscles, you know, a contracted muscle has no blood supply. The blood, as I mentioned, runs through the fibers of the muscle in the blood vessels. If your muscle's contracted, it's squeezing out. The blood supply. It's like, you know, I say to people, if I ask you to hold your arm out with, you know, if you had a bag in your hand or say, you know, you're walking around with a heavy bag, you eventually get that burning pain in your muscle. That's called ischemic pain. That's the, the muscle running out of blood and going, can you please stop? And what do you do? You switch hands, right? You let blood perfuse back into that muscle and then the pain goes away. If you are standing off your center all the time, you're basically in that ischemic position. So that you're reducing the blood flow. In the neutral position, the blood can reperfuse into the tissues because you're in on balance, nothing's having to grip to hold you there. So if you're in performance and you're moving around, every time you pass through that neutral, the body can go, oh, reperfuse or you're offloading different muscles in different positions so one can fill up while the other one's being used. But if you're in this kind of stuck, rigid state, then you're getting into that issue, which is why people can often feel lightheaded sometimes, particularly when you're vocalizing there, because it's just there's just no flow. You know, we need to be in flow. I'm just pressing the pause button on the podcast for a very brief moment to invite you to book your free BAST call. If you've been thinking about joining the BAST community through one of our courses, but you just don't know which option is the best for you, then why not book your free Zoom chat with our very own Kimberly George, who has all the answers. Head over to basttraining.com forward slash book a call forward slash and click that big blue button. 
That's basttraining.com forward slash book a call forward slash. Now, where were we? How does that relate to performers who might find themselves in a role? Like take Quasimodo for, as, as an example, because the performer there may well be directed into having more of this arched over posture. They'll have the hump as part yeah. of their costume, but as part of the character, we know them to be hunched over. That's quite an exhalatory position. I think from Alexander Technique, the monkey bend sort of position can be used to find like a splat breath, for example. How might that position impact that performer if they're always in that sort of bent over position? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, I, this is something I've worked with, with artists for m many years, particularly if you're doing eight shows a week, playing this particular character with a particular, and it's, you know, Quasimodo is an extreme example. I used to work with a lot of the Beauty and the Beast, the, you know, the wardrobe, Lumia, you know, they're all in these fixed positions that are unnatural and it's, it takes a big toll. And I've seen a lot of injuries and issues as, as a result of, of that. But, and it's, and it's like you say, it's not just those extreme examples. It may be that your character is very sad and enclosed and so is in this sort of shrunken posture because when we're talking about body alignment, just as I said to, you know, if a teacher sees a round, someone with round shoulders and just says, pull them back, they're not going to be able to if the tissue shortened. They're also not going to be able to if they're not emotionally able. That might be an, an emotionally protective position mm -hmm. that they're in. And by shifting them out of it, you can bring up a lot of stuff. And if you're not ready for that, you can actually destabilize them emotionally by making big shifts in posture. But similarly, if we're playing a character that has a particular body language that goes with it, you are still, you know, as, as an actor, as an artist, you're still physiologically getting the effects of what that person would have, right? Yeah. Uh, so my, my, the way I, I address that with, with people is that you need to unravel it because you can end up falling into the trap. I mean, particularly I've worked in the past with method actors, right? Who literally live that character 24 seven in order to, to produce it. And then they get all the issues that go along with whatever that character is. Unless you're playing like Mary Poppins, then you're going to be pretending well, to get into, into issues. So you have to you have to come out of it. You have to offset it. So if your you know your character is say the Quasimodo, where you're round shouldered, you've got heavy weighted costume, and it's having a toll on the body. You have to do specific stretches to unravel, you know, stretch out the things that were tight, tighten up the things that pull long. And you need a, really a sort of a physical training routine that is there. Once you come off stage, you undo what was done so that you're not getting into cumulative effects. So whatever you did in that performance you unravel with your stretches and strengthening routine so that you're not carrying it from one day into the next, into the next, into the next, into the next until suddenly you've got pain. And I've seen it a lot. I used to see when I worked with both West End performers and with Broadway performers, I would almost, you know, they tell me what part they're playing in a different, in a particular show. And I knew all the things that they'd have going on. I even used to, there were some shows I would work regularly with the cast and the swing, if anyone's familiar with like the swing is, is somebody who covers several different roles. They're not on stage every night. They kind of hang in the dressing room. Then when someone's off, they go on for a certain role. If I was treating the swing, I'd be like, don't tell me, oh, it's right side of your net. Oh, you went on for that last night. You were on for that cut. So I almost thought at one point I was going to write a book about all the injuries that go with particular characters in particular shows. But so we, you need to know what the physical, you know, issues are with the particular role you're playing or particular motion you're expressing and make sure you're unraveling that physically and emotionally mm. as well. Make sure you remember who you are. For me, it's a similar thing to, I've worked in the past with quite a few tribute artists 
who are singing in the voice of whatever artist all the time. And then they start to have issues with their own because they're never singing in their own voice. It's like you have to spend time singing in your own voice as well. That's the equivalent to me of neutral posture. Mm. Where's your neutral for your voice so that you can go out to these extremes with a degree of elasticity, but you know where to return to neutral. So be it from vocal technique, be it from postural alignment, be it from emotional state, where are you? Where is your neutral physically, emotionally, technically? And make sure that you're, you know where that is, you're spending the time there and wherever you can during that performance, you're returning to it within the bounds of choreography, costume, whatever is being thrown at you. Elasticity is the key to, to being an artist. Yeah. And how, how can we even train that in, in the room? Are we, are we getting them to, oh, it probably would help for them to understand what sort of position they might be in so that they can have a good vocal experience. But yeah, how can we bring that into the room so that we can adopt lots of different postures, but still have vocal efficiency? Yeah, so the key is to find that neutral for everyone because the person who's been hunched over their phone for ages and had their head forward, when I, you know, help guide them to where neutral is for them, they're like, oh, this feels like I'm falling backwards because your whole mind map of where you think neutral is has been offset to this new position that balances you around whatever it is you've been doing. So when, like you said, earlier, you know, oh, neutral should feel efficient for most people who've been off that and I help them find their neutral and they're like, this feels like such hard work. This feels really weird. I feel like I'm going to fall backwards. I feel so helping people remap what the felt, because at the end of the day, this is, this is not like, like I said, a thing, a list on a checklist. This is a felt sense of neutral and it will, it does change people emotionally as well. Mm -hmm. So you need to be mindful of that. So finding, I mean, I can talk through like a physical thing of how, how to help people find neutral, but as an artist, if you know where that is, then again, I talked to earlier about you've got options. Yeah. I can go to this extreme, but I can come back to neutral. I can go to this extreme. I can come back to neutral, even emotionally. So if I, coaching someone on a song and, you know, we want a particular emotional narrative to come through it, often I'll go, let's go right super large on this, like go over the top of being angry. Mm. Then let's bring it back, find the extremes and then find on a like, you know, it's, you don't just have like on or off, you've got a fader then. How much of that do I want to dial in? How, how much of that emotion changes my physical shape and how can I dial that back a bit? And when you've got that ability to have a fader on all these things, be it a physical alignment, be it an emotional alignment, you can even choose on a daily basis if you're doing eight shows a week of the same thing. You might be, you know what, I'm not going to take that to eight today because I'm feeling a bit off myself or I've got, I'm nursing an injury or I think. I'm just going to take that emotional expression to about five today and, and put it back so that you're eight, you have the control over it. You know, most people feel like their bodies are in control of that or their emotions are in control of them. Whereas if we know where neutral is, we know how far we can reach before we fall over yeah. and then gauge how far we want to go along that track and what payoff is for that and what do I need to do to restitute that afterwards to offset it with stretches or whatever to rebalance myself afterwards but if you don't know where you are to start with then you don't you know I often say you can have an idea and this is again for people even on a macro level of their career it's like you can have a goal about what you want to achieve you can have written yourself the best business plan of how you're going to get there but if you don't know your starting coordinates, not going to happen, right? You can have a, I want to get to this city. I've got a map or a GPS to get there, but I don't know where I'm starting from. 
you're never going to get there. And that's the issue. Most people don't know where they're starting from. So they're trying to go to all these places and they're in control falling at that mm. point. Okay. Which is inefficient physically and emotionally. Yeah. So how do we how do we find our neutral? Can you talk us through that? Yeah. So the the first thing I normally do with people is to to find that spinal alignment. And the best way to do it, you know, it's very nebulous for people, particularly when they're sitting or standing, because they're in their habit and they've got no kind of feedback to tell them, you know, where, what, what, where, what's a guide point, what's a guide rail for that. So what I have people do is lie on the floor on their back, knees bent, so your feet are on the floor and your knees are bent because that softens the spine into a neutral position. Okay, we've got your legs straightened out, that's a different thing and we'll, we'll talk about that because that's a progression. So you start with the knees bent, feet on the floor, lying on your back. And then I get people to bring their awareness to the spine. And I say, right, start at the base of your spine and you should feel your sacrum, which is that triangular bone at the base of the spine. That's in contact with the floor, typically. And then you might find there's a little rise up above that, the lumbar spine. There's a little arch and I get people to slide a hand underneath. How high is it? How flat is it? And again, that's different for different people. Some people it's flat on the floor, even in a resting position. Right. But for most people, there's a little rise there. Then feel your thoracic spine, the middle part of your spine. That's going to be coming back in contact with the floor and you'll feel the back of your ribs there, your shoulder blades. And then get a sense for balance between left and right because the body's not symmetrical. And again, people have this idea that everything in the body is perfectly symmetrical and, you know, everything matches up. It doesn't. Either because of the way we grew, it's what we call an anatomical asymmetry, but it also may be a postural asymmetry that you play the cello or something and you've grown up around a cello in a rotated position and then your body's kind of fixed into that shape so being aware and embracing your asymmetries there's mm. nothing wrong with it so some people have a little scoliosis in the spine so when they're lying down one side of their rib cage feels different to the other it might be more in contact or less in contact than the other side so embracing that finding where is your neutral then obviously coming up to the neck and again, often the neck would rise up a little bit, you know, because the back of the skull's on the, on the floor. And so dial into what does that feel like? Can you get an inner mind map of that shape? What's touching, what's rising up? And that gives you a sense of your neutral curves. So once I've had people explore that, what I can also often do, which helps to, again, explore the extremes to find the middle from that position, once we've established where are my natural curves, okay, now tuck your pelvis, tilt that pelvis under. What's changed? Oh, now my lumbar spine's touching the floor. I've flattened out my lumbar curve. Okay, release back to the neutral. Okay, now arch and tilt the pelvis anteriorly the other way. Oh, I've now got a really extreme arch and my shoulders are being pushed into the floor more. Okay, that's the other extreme. Come back to the middle. So explore the extremes to find the middle and get them to get a sense of how, how efficient does that feel to you? It's like, oh, that feels nice, that middle bit. Those other things feel like, oh, that's effort, that's effort. This feels nice, the Goldilocks. Once they've established that with the knees bent, I then get them to very slowly straighten the knees out whilst being mindful of what changes in the spine as that happens. So for some people, they might find as they straighten their legs out, they start to exaggerate that lumbar arch. They're tilting. So then I'll say, well, what, what's caused that? What do you think has driven that arch to increase? And typically what it is, is our hip flexor muscles, which when you've got your knees bent, we've got them switched off. As we're straightening our legs, we're strength straightening out those muscles. So that's the quad muscles tensor fascia lata and also that psoas muscle if those are tight and people that spend a lot of time sitting at desks are like tight in their hip flexors they're pulling on you know the psoas in particular is pulling on the lumbar spine as as you go forward and tilting it more so again if that's the case 
they might need some hands-on work to release the tension in those hip flexors in order to allow them to get into a neutral position with the leg straight. Because by straightening the legs, we're actually representing what it's like to be standing, right? Right. These benches are the same as sitting. So, so it's bringing to their attention what is driving any changes in the alignment and what they need to pay attention to, maybe with some stretches or with some hands-on work to help release those tight tissues. If you've got somebody who, when they straighten out, is actually still collapsed with that tucked pelvis, it may be they've got tight hamstrings, which are pulling the other way on the pelvis and causing that tucked position. So it just allows them to explore um, what their habits are and what's driving that. So once they've done that, now you can bring it into a standing position because they've kind of got the memory of what we call the kinesthetic feedback that they got from the floor they can sort of recreate that. Or do you remember that sensation of what was touching the floor, what wasn't in that neutral position and recreate that in a standing position? And then again, in a standing position, I'll say, right, tuck that pelvis under, what's changed, come back to neutral, go into a tilted position, come back to neutral. So they then explore it in the standing state and hopefully then they can start to get a connection with the felt sense of that neutral alignment I know, okay, this is the most efficient, this is me in neutral, and then I can explore from this from other places, but I have my autocorrect place to to revert to. It's like you you know where home base is. So because you're you're a clinical osteopath, is this still something that us mere mortal can do in the studio? <laughs> so I mean you can take take a student through that and do it on try it on yourself. It's very easy. And it's one of those things, if you're a teacher, the more you, you explore this with different students, you'll start to see the differences in different morphologies, different body types, and you'll start to get more of an eye for it as well. So you'll actually be able to spot when someone's out. You'll spot more subtle changes. Um, it's like anything. If you don't know something, you look at it, you don't see the subtleties, but the more you get familiar with it, you'll be able to tell subtleties. and also explore okay let's try singing that with a really arch pelvis see how it changes the sound because again just the, the body alignment can be a bit nebulous for people so what i'll often do with accompanying with that lying down standing up and exploring those different positions particularly in the standing position i'll say right tuck that pelvis under take a deep breath what does that feel like now arch take a deep oh that feels right a lot of effort Come back to neutral, take your deep breath. Oh, that feels really juicy and, and, and elastic. So they can connect then the outcome with the position as well. Mm. Now try that vocal line. You'll often see as well, again, if, you're, if your eye is tuned to it, people will often, when they're going to a line they struggle with, maybe it's a particular pitch or range or something or, or an interval that they're They'll change something in their body to, to like muscle it to get, they'll tuck that pelvis or they'll arch it to try and achieve that. But it's actually sabotaging the line. Mm. So whatever they're doing, get them to do the opposite. Okay. And what did that change? Let's find that. Remember that neutral alignment? Okay. Do not move out. Even, you know, you can put your hands around their pelvis and go, right, we're not moving from this position as you go. And they're like, I want to tilt to get that note. Let's stay here and see what happens. So again, you're, they're then able to connect outcome from sound or from quality to a particular body position. And again, be able to explore different ways of getting that sound and come to a sense of what was the most efficient one for me to get that sound. So it's very important that we triangulate things. The nervous system is kind of what's creating the software program, if you like, for achieving that line. What, is, what are the things that we want to put in software program to, so that that line comes out in, the, in a predictable way each time? Um, but it likes to have lots of the more points of, of, of contact it has. Like I said, you need a starting point, a destination, and a, to get there, the more points of reference it has 
the more predictable that will be. So then that gets you out of the emotion. Because again, I see it with, again, tricky passages in songs. You see the fear coming in their eyes before they're about to do it. The fear's already changed the posture because body language is, follows emotions. <laughs> no. And they've sabotaged it physically because of an emotional anticipation of something that was attached to another thing. Change the body position. The nervous system has no context there for the fear. So actually by changing the body position, you, you can remove the emotional fear out of it. One of the quick and easiest things I do, particularly, I mean, it's often the high notes that people are stressing, right? Quick and easy way to do it that literally clears up 99% of these issues is I get people to hang upside down and sing it. Yeah. Yeah. And suddenly none of the problems exist. I said, but if you can do it there, you can do it. It's not that you can't do it. It's just something you're doing when you're the other way up under gravity is sabotaging it. So let's figure out what that is and eliminate that. And then when that's not present, the nervous system doesn't have a context for it. It doesn't work that was attached to this other posture. So it can, can quickly get people out of, you know, their, their little dead end passageways that they get attached to with certain, certain notes or passages. Coming up in part two, we are delving into the optimal teaching setup, how the body presents emotional life, and the importance of body language in the audition scenario. We'll see you there. Do, 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 do.